Good afternoon, Thank Senator. You both. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Berwick. I feel like um, a, a parent here failing at um, my staff with their wonderful presentations and the folks who have joined them to highlight some of these very complicated but important topics and ones that, as I keep saying, maybe it's our time to really make some change. And so we'll be back on all these topics as 2021 proceeds. So it's um, lovely to send my, see my good friend, Senator Jay Rockefeller, and to join him in uh, welcoming Dr. Donald Berwick to present this year's Senator Rockefeller Lecture. Dr. Berwick is a Harvard-educated pediatrician. He's been a delight to get to know a little bit during this process of arranging the lecture. He's one of the country's leading advocates for ensuring access to high-quality health care currently President Emeritus and Senior Fellow at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and a lecturer at the Department of Healthcare Policy at Harvard Medical School. He served as the administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services during the Obama administration, where he oversaw the rollout of the crucial healthcare reform regulations, including the rules for the Affordable Care Act Health Insurance Exchange. Amen for that work. His nomination for CMS administrator came at a fraught time. As Senator Rockefeller said then, it was a dramatically negative environment. Yet your tenure there, Dr. Berwick, at CMS was so important. Dr. Berwick's vision as CMS administrator helped lead to the endurance of the Affordable Care Act, which just marked its 11th anniversary and which we have the pleasure of seeing President Biden improving and making more accessible for people who need access to health insurance. In 2013, Dr. Berwick ran for governor of Massachusetts seeking economic and health justice. And I watched that campaign and donated to it. Um, so good for you. And promoting a single payer health system. As he said at that time, I'm worried about the failure to realize progressive issues I care about. Healthcare is a human right, poverty and justice. These issues are under siege in America. That was in 2013. I'm glad to introduce Donald Berwick to provide this year's Senator Jay Rockefeller lecture and to hear his thoughts on where we are now in 2021 in our efforts to secure access to quality healthcare and social justice. Dr. Berwick. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Senator, for joining us today. Uh, bear with us just a moment as we move some cameras around and change presenters to Dr. Berwick. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Judy. Judy, this is your 35th year, is it not? Yes, it is. The 35th year of the Center for Medicare Advocacy. There we go. It was the right. morning in the office set, when doctor. I was alone when I realized I had started the organization on April Fool's Day. Dr. Berwick. Thank you so much, Judy. Uh, let me just check with Matt. Can you see my slide correctly? Yes, sir. Uh, so my photo is not overlaying the slide as it is on my screen? No, not at all. Thank you so much. Well, first, let me uh, thank again, uh, Judy, and, and congratulate you and and from the bottom of my heart, thank you for your decades of leadership on this really important frontier. Uh, thank uh, Ben Bolton and the board of the Center for Medicare Advocacy and, and to the center for your ongoing crucial voice in this, uh, in this uh, struggle that goes on. Uh, and then finally, uh, a word of just admiration and deep respect and thanks to Senator Rockefeller. I, I am beyond words uh, to be able to give a lecture in his name. Uh, in Washington, when I was there, uh, there were real problems of interaction, and we, we lacked enough examples of the kind of uh, clarity and civility and compassion and respect and warmth that uh, Senator Rockefeller represented, not to mention his progressive policy values. Senator, it was an honor to work with you there, and I, I'm so grateful to you on my, my own behalf, on behalf of the nation, for the leadership that you have shown in your remarkable career. Um, the talk I'd like to give you is rather personal talk, uh, and it 
I got to warn you, no. spoiler alert, it doesn't, it doesn't really end. Um, I, uh, Pat, I'm hearing some feedback. I think perhaps there are participants that might want to mute themselves. Um, so I've been on a bit of a journey. Uh, running Medicare and Medicaid uh, as the administrator leading that was the highlight of my career. It was a deeply, deeply meaningful episode of my life. I loved every minute of it and the chance to serve uh, people in need um, struck me. Uh, at that time, as a physician, I, of course, was focused on their health care, but also their health and tried to lead the center into a self-concept of pursuing what we call the triple aim, better care for individuals, better health for populations and lower per capita costs. But I was uh, intimately aware, aware of the issues that you've heard the prior panels talk about in terms of what creates health and wellness. And that's the topic I want to address with, to you and try to translate it into policy, into policy terms. Um, I have no conflicts of interest to declare with respect to this talk. My career has been spent trying to work on the improvement of healthcare uh, as a physician, but also uh, in the work of uh, establishing and leading the, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and my subsequent work on quality. Uh, I'm trying to make healthcare better all over the world. When you work in the field of quality, the technical uh, knowledge, the technical lesson is you better have aims. You never improve by accident. I, I will never learn to speak Spanish unless I, in, I intend to speak Spanish. And we won't improve healthcare unless we intend to do that with respect to specific improvements sought. So for decades, my work has involved establishing aims for improvement. That got a tremendous boost from the National Academy of Medicine, at that time the Institute of Medicine in 1999 and 2001, with two reports that I'm sure many of you are totally familiar with. Uh, this came from a committee on quality of care in America, in which I was privileged to serve and um, uh, chair one of the subcommittees. Uh, the first report in 1999 was about patient safety, and that took all the decades of research we'd had on injuries to patients in the care system from errors in their care, almost all unintended, but almost all avertable if we focused on safety. That report famously said that there were 44 to 98,000 deaths a year in American hospitals, not counting ambulatory care and nursing homes, from errors in care, and that we ought to have a national agenda for safety. Uh, two years later, the National Academy, the Institute of Medicine, produced the more comprehensive report, which I helped to write, called Crossing the Quality Chasm. And that chasm report lays out additional aims for improvement. This is a list that I actually had the chance to draft and uh, believe deeply in. And the aims for improvement proposed in that report for American healthcare were that care should be safer, fewer, fewer injuries and deaths from care, effective, uh, aligned with science, evidence-based, patient-centered, shifting power to patients and families and communities, timely, uh, timelier, so that delays were averted, uh, efficient, a reduction of waste. In the modern view of quality, waste is unquality, and we know that there's a tremendous amount of uh, non-value-added activity in healthcare. And then finally, equity, which we've talked about a lot in this meeting and luckily is now, happily is now on the, on the lips of the nation. Uh, had I lit, written this list now, I think I probably would have put equity first, uh, and uh, I somewhat lament that I did not. But this is sort of the charter for the work of improvement uh, and was adopted widely in the United States, in fact, globally, as aims for improvement, uh, the, the first part of the journey of improvement after aims comes methods. Uh, in 2006, two colleagues of mine, uh, Dr. John Whittington from Peoria, Illinois, and uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Tom Nolan, one of the great experts of the century on improvement, unfortunately passed away about two years ago. John and Tom, faculty at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, came forward with this critique. They said that the Institute of Medicine aims safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable care actually was about the experience of care for people in the care system, which is very important, but they, they know, as I know, as you know, that uh, the healthcare system does not create health. It's a repair shop. And the generators of the illness, injury, and disabilities we live with lie in part in our genes, but very largely in our communities, as prior panelists have pointed out. And they said, if we're really going to invest as a nation in the improvement of health, we better have a second name, not just improvement of care for people in care, safe, effective, patient-centered, family efficient, equitable, but also improvement of the health of populations by working on the upstream causes of illness, injury, and disability, and that that should be mapped centrally into the work of the healthcare world and our national investments. Uh, third, they pointed out that we had dramatic evidence of levels of waste in American health care. You all know we're spending about almost 50% more than the next most expensive nation, which I think is Switzerland, 
uh, but our outcomes are nowhere near tops. Uh, we are about 40th, I believe, in life expectancy and infant mortality. Uh, we underperform by almost every metric from the OECD. Uh, and uh, so we're, we have a lot of non-value-added activity in a bloated uh, healthcare system. And they then propose the triple aim, better care, better care for individuals, better health for populations, and lower per capita costs. When I went to Medicare, uh, I uh, took this as the mission. I brought this to my superb 5,500 staff and said, why don't we accomplish this? Let's, let's have a federal leadership in healthcare for better care for individuals, better health for populations, and continuous reduction of waste. And all of their strategies were focused on pursuit of these aims. Uh, so that if you'd stopped me in 2010 or 2011 and said, what are you working on? I would have said the National Academy of Medicine aims, six aims, and the triple aim. Um, one way to that I would offer to you that I use this stuff actively all the time is whenever I'm asked to interrogate healthcare reform policies when I served on the advisory groups to the Biden campaign uh, on health policy or to Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, um, if they propose something, I interrogate the proposal this way. Uh, number one, will it create health? Will it move us toward healthcare as a human right? We're the only na developed nation on earth in which healthcare is not a human right. That's a terrible travesty, and it's time to end it. And so I say, will this reform uh, make move us toward healthcare as a human right? And then after that, the three other questions are the triple A: Will it help us improve quality? The six aims for improvement. Will it help improve the causes of illness, injury, and disability? Social determinants. And will it reduce per capita costs uh, through reduction of waste? I believe that, by the way, this was exactly, uh, it's a very powerful and useful framework for interrogation of any of the healthcare reform proposals that you're going to see downstream. The critique we just heard about Medicare Advantage ought definitely to be subjected to this interrogation. Um, and now, uh, as in all days, uh, there's a context. The context that's most relevant right now is, of course, the pandemic. And by the way, future uh, 21st century threats, I, I co-chaired a National Academy of Medicine Committee on 21st century threats just in 2019. And uh, we didn't know COVID-19 was gonna come, but we sure had a list of ways that the 21st century could come at us and we better be ready. And then the George Floyd murder and the, the tragedies of, of uh, the heritage of slavery and structural racism in our country, which now, once again, we're revisiting and hopefully this time with real authenticity. Uh, then along, so along came COVID, and I'll, I'll just take a little detour here to show you what I think COVID is doing to that whole terrain of uh, of, of um, making healthcare better. Uh, I wrote this viewpoint at the request of the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, back a year ago, or May of 2020. They asked me to write about what I thought the new normal would be when we emerged from COVID. I said I really don't know. What I thought I could guess at were the choices that COVID's bringing us, because this this earthquake, this COVID tectonic is changing a lot about the way we thought about care. And we're gonna be able to choose whether to keep or toss a lot of these changes. Uh, very quickly, the, the six that I highlight in that article are speed. Uh, healthcare has been very slow to adopt important innovations of, uh, historically for a century. Uh, that all changed in COVID. We have breathtaking speed in learning and, and improvement in, in the system. Uh, the, the hallmark for this was a, a, an email I got about maybe two or three days after the COVID virus arrived in Seattle. Uh, it was it was a three-page document created by intensive care doctors in Seattle on their own initiative from interviewing intensive care doctors in Wuhan, China, about what they what the Chinese doctors had learned about managing COVID patients, and it was this very dense and very important set of lessons learned. That was on my desk, and I'm a pediatrician, not even in practice, and I got it within days of the arrival of the of the virus in Seattle, a incredible breathtaking speed of knowledge exchange. I serve on the Journal Oversight Committee for the, for the Journal of the American Medical Association, and our turnaround times for papers are shortened to, in some cases, hours instead of the traditional weeks or even months of review. The National Academy of Medicine set up a standing committee on uh, emerging infections and 21st century threats on which I serve. Uh, that committee was established in March of 2020, and uh, it, it had produced one month later, 30 days after establishment, it produced 11 uh, scientific reports on COVID issues. This is the National Academy usually takes 18 months to produce a pedigreed report. We were able to do that in breathtaking time. We can keep that or change it. That is, as we come back to 
past COVID, hopefully, we well, do we want to keep this tempo, this idea of speeding knowledge so quickly? The second issue is standardization. There's traditional fighting in healthcare between, you know, what is argued as physician autonomy, the ability to tolerate, and in fact, even celebrate variation in care, or to commit more firmly to evidence-based standards. Uh, both sides have a case. In COVID, this has been well settled in the sense that physicians nurses, pharmacists all over the world are searching for standards. It's an avid sense of finding out what's best and bringing it home. I've never seen anything quite like it. Uh, the virtual care world, we've heard a lot about, uh, you know, we, we went to 95% virtual care in a community health center near me in Boston from 5% in one week. And that's actually getting us in this whole wonderful new world of telemedicine, telehealth, what it can promise. And by the way, reconsidering waste in the form of unneeded visits. Lots of people in the COVID pandemic didn't get care they need, but lots of people avoided getting care that they, it turns out they didn't need in the first place. And hopefully we'll be able to dissect that. Protecting the workforce, I'll talk more about, but our whole concept of the workforce has changed as we found ourselves on our heels, not protecting the workforce. I'll have more to say about that in a minute. We've also broadened our view of the workforce. Now I think when people say healthcare workforce, they have a much more Catholic idea of, of what that word means. Uh, involving not just doctors and nurses and therapists and pharmacists, but really the people that serve the food and drive the vans and clean clean the rooms. Uh, that's the workforce too. Preparedness could be a whole other lecture. I'm not going to dive deeply into it. This country was caught way behind. Uh, the third worst, the top among the three worst outcomes in the world, even though we were rated as prepared, by the way, by indices from the World Health Organization and the United Nations, we were not. And we, we had our hands slapped and we better learn about that. Partly was a deep, deep failure of leadership that hopefully will not be repeated. But even, even that is not enough to explain a lot of the lacks we, we suffered. And then inequity, which is the topic of the rest of my remarks, because you all know the data about the uh, predictable, selective, negative, uh, asymmetric negative impact of the pandemic on communities of color, especially including uh, African-Americans. Latinx, uh, Native Americans, and other communities that have been marginalized. I, I want to take that thought into the workforce for a minute. Uh, you may not know this, but uh, it's important. Uh, this article back in May of 2020 made the point more than 800,000 healthcare workers and almost 1.1 million of their children live in poverty, below the poverty line across the U.S according to an American Journal of Public Health study, of the 18 and a half million people employed in the healthcare industry, 10% uh, of them earn so little in healthcare, they get paid so little that they get healthcare through Medicaid. And 1.4 million he healthcare workers, 1.4 million people employed in healthcare have no health insurance at all. We're gonna be talking a lot about inequity and disparity. I wanna make the point that it's in us, it's in our industry as well, and uh, we have no, um, uh, good standing to point fingers at an unequal nation when we tolerate this level of inequality and neglect within our own systems. This, this needs fixing. I will point out that the, defini the very definition of poverty in the United States itself is defective. Uh, it, it relies on a model of uh, poverty that uh, goes back to the 1950s and is, is uh, completely inadequate and from the point of view of civilized nations around the world, a very stingy way to describe what people actually need to have the full lives that we want to, to guarantee them. Now, the, a lot of the rest of my talk is going to be drawn from the work of this man, uh, Sir Michael Marmot, uh, a really her hero on the, on the global public health stage. Uh, I feel very fortunate to be his friend and colleague. Michael, for uh, his entire 40, 45 year career, has been one of the real important scholars in the world on inequity, on gaps. He asked, has asked the question for decades. Why do we have unequal health in the world, both internationally and within nations? He is a scientist of the first caliber. And what he did for us is a favor in 2015 by writing this book, The Health Gap. If I had the, the, the uh, authority to require reading of the people listening to my voice right now, I would say this is your required reading. You have to buy and read this book. It's not the only book of its type. A more recent book in 2019 by my friend, uh, Dr. Sandro Galea, the dean of the, Har of the BU School of Public Health, uh, that book is called Well, and it's equally uh, a digest. But what, what Marmot and Galea have done is taken a vast scientific literature and uh, 
organized it for our consumption, uh, us nine specialists, to try to understand what generates inequalities in health and well-being uh, across nations and within nations. Uh, the terminology we use is social determinants of health. Everybody knows that. That's the surface up on that term. But what Marmot does is help us give that definition. So you're about to go to school with me on what that term means, social determinants of health. And it's actually pretty clear. A lot of the literature, according to Marmot, sorts into five categories of influence on health, the things that make us healthy or keep us from becoming or being healthy. Um, there are more than these five, but, the, but much of the literature supports this analysis. The first is the experience of kids in early childhood. This is not just a make nice or kind of politically correct uh, comment on the left. This is a scientific finding that I think of all the social terms of health, the one that seems most powerful is, how, is whether children in their very early years experience a good birthing, good, good uh, toddler supports, good school pre-readiness experiences and avoid toxic stresses or are supported when they meet stresses in their lives. I'll show you a lot more about that later. But that's the number one on this list. I'm a pediatrician. I'm father of four. I'm grandfather of eight. So, of course, this means a lot to me. The second is education systems. If you look at disparities or differences among nations, even within nations in health status, the strength of education systems is very tightly correlated with the health and wellness of a country. Uh, now, you might say that's a correlation, not a causation, but believe me, Marmot and his colleagues uh, are able to dissect out causal pathways. And it looks like this. Countries or regions that invest in strong supports for education for children, especially girls, but not just girls, and assure kind of equity of access to really high educational opportunity are much longer alive than healthier nations. The third are nature of the workplace. I already mentioned minimum wages. Uh, we have... Um, a very uh, low uh, bar. Uh, we've set a very low bar in minimum wage in this country. More progressive nations set minimum wages at wages sufficient for leading a, a full life. And there are definite ways to define that. The way we define minimum wage has nothing to do with that. Uh, so um, it, it, Marmot's observation is that in those nations that, are, that have much higher guaranteed supports for workers are much longer alive, much healthier than ours. Or nations that are low, and and that, and then there are other conditions in the workplace, such as really meaning in work, uh, protection of worker rights, uh, avoidance of toxins in the workplace. The work conditions is a third category of social determinants. The fourth is the experience of elders. This is a very interesting point, which is that uh, Marmot's observation is that uh, communities, uh, countries that have support systems for aging, that especially focus on keeping elders from becoming lonely or isolated and also keep them in the economy, keep them active. These are also longer life societies and healthier for everyone, not just elders. And the fifth of, Mark, of Marmot's five determinants, as he calls community resilience. He should call this miscellaneous. It's a list of um, characteristics of communities that he thinks give communities a sense of agency and possibility. People living there feel that they can do what they want. Uh, these would include the list you'd make, food security, housing, security, uh, recreational opportunities, uh, environmental, uh, uh, environmental cleanliness, uh, air, air quality, criminal justice uh, systems that are, that are restorative, uh, and um, hard work on violence. Um, so that's the five. Um, I'll, I'll say first, the US scores very poorly on these. We have excellent studies from the OECD, uh, from the work of people like Steve Wolf at VCU, and others, um, we have we don't lack data, uh, and and we are very low rated in our overall uh, guarantees of of a good experience for kids in childhood. We're 17 out of the, number 17 out of 17 countries studied, for example, in a National Academy of Medicine study uh, among OECD nations. Our educational achievement, although we have very good education in some places, we have very poor others, and our overall achievement is not anywhere near uh, setting the standard in the world. Our uh, workplace conditions, including minimum wage structures, are not are not leading the world anything close. We do not have a cogent national agenda for elder care. Thirty percent of elders, as you may know, are, are impoverished, and loneliness is rampant. Uh, as our new Surgeon General uh, Vivek Murthy has written about uh, eloquently, and then community resilience. Pick your structure. Food security. We have uh, 40 billion hungry people in this country right now. 17 million children in food insecurity. 
housing. Uh, we have um, official totals about 700,000 people chronically homeless. I think that's a low by a, by a factor of several fold compared to what's really going on out there and a lot of uh, housing instability uh, and so on. So we're, we're actually not doing very well. And, and Marmot observes variation among nations with respect to these social determinants. So that leads him to his sixth category. He says, why? Why are we not seeing more evenness or maybe what explains performance levels with respect to the social determinants? And he, he determines that it's a characteristic he calls fairness. He could have chosen many different words. Um, I, I think it might be more closer to solidarity, a uh, sense of mutual responsibility, uh, communities where um, instead of every person for himself or herself, it's like we are together trying to help each other. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a value system ambient in, in societies, and it correlates very highly with the social determinants, which then correlate with health. So this is Marmot's uh, uh, summary statement, inequities in power, money, and resources, that's the unfairness he talks about, inequities in power, money, and resources give rise to inequities in the conditions of daily life, those are the social determinants, which in turn lead to inequities in health. This is the train of effect he's talking about. And as you know, our measures of inequity in American society, our Gini index and other metrics show that we are not committed to equity in power, money, and resources in this country, not as a matter of policy. Indeed, one might argue that sociologically, we seem to celebrate uh, inequities as some form of achievement for those who end up on top. Uh, the consequences for health are dire. Uh, this uh, is work from the brilliant Raj Chetty, uh, who uh, has studied inequity uh, deeply. This is expected age at death versus household income percentile for people who read age, reach age 40. And notice a couple things. One is how vast the gap is. If you compare life expectancy for the bottom 1% of women to the top 1% of women with household in income, that's a 10-year life, life expectancy gap. For men, it's, uh, it's a 15-year life expectancy gap. And notice that that gap persists throughout the, the uh, percentile distribution. That curve never tips over to horizontal. It's a, there's a constant relationship between income percentile and life expectancy. Uh, I want to dig deeply with you for a minute into one of the social determinants, the one that uh, always catches my eye as a pediatrician, as I said, uh, and that has to do with that first one, early childhood experience. And we actually have a very interesting asset just appeared in, November, in December from the Surgeon General in California who published this report, Roadmap for Resilience, which is a report on that on the data on adverse child experiences and toxic stress in children, that is the conditions in which children are being raised, especially in early years, and health status. And then actually it lays out a, uh, an agenda for the state. I don't know if this California will adopt it, but they sure should. And uh, it's a very, uh, it's a long but very important summary of the literature on that first social determinant. Uh, this is one of the bottom lines. Now, I, this uses an uh, index called ACEs. That's the Adverse Childhood Experiences Index, developed by Kaiser Permanente and the CDC. I'm going to say about 15 years ago. It was a very simple idea that turned out to be very powerful, which is if you take young kids and count the number of severe stresses they're subjected to, to things like exposure to violence, exposure to substance misuse, exposure to um, to uh, environmental threats things that make kids stressed. Uh, you, can, you can score in the, kid, the, the 10 stressors, uh, you can score it just as the count of number of stresses a kid's subjected to. And this shows the odds ratios for adult, adult disease burden for kids with four or more ACEs. So in childhood, they're exposed to stresses. This is what happens to their health as adults. Uh, look at that, double the risk of heart disease for four or more ACEs. Uh, more than double the risk of cancer, more than two and a half times the risk of accidents, chronic respiratory disease, chronic lung disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, kidney disease, suicide. There's hardly any adult chronic disease burden or risk that is not strongly associated with the, with the exposures that kids are seeing as young kids. These are very, very powerful influences. Now, if that's true, let's take a look at how we're doing. So this is a paper that came out in uh, Health Affairs uh, last October. It's, a, uh, it's the updated version of something called the Childhood Opportunity Index, the Child Opportunity Index, the COI. I, I suggest you might want to study it if you don't know it. It's a multi-institutional consortium, must mostly use university consortium in the US, uh, which, um, which maintains an index 
of neighborhoods in the U.S. with respect to child opportunities. 73,000 census tracts, 73,000 neighborhoods are scored in the U.S. for their childhood opportunity. What does that mean? Well, it's a complex index. This shows you the components of the child opportunity index. It's extremely carefully developed. Uh, it's obviously multifactorial. The three major threads are education, the health and environment, circumstances of kids and social and economic circumstances. And so these researchers rate every one of 73,000 census tracts for child opportunity. Here to give it a little more vividness for you, I've made two hypothetical neighborhoods, A and B. So neighborhood A would be a very low opportunity neighborhood, neighborhood B a very high opportunity neighborhood. Uh, and so neighborhood A has a higher poverty rate, lower access to early childhood education, less green space, less food security, less housing security compared to neighborhood B. I always present this stuff with a little hesitation because I'm well aware of the literature on asset-based as opposed to deficit-based characterizations of all communities. And undoubtedly neighborhood A, though it's scored as having a lot of problems, also has uh, much cultural rich wealth and, and, uh, and uh, wisdom and other forms of assets. I don't mean to ignore that, but the kids in neighborhood A are being raised in conditions that are quite stressful to them. And in Michael Marmot's research summary would say those kids will be less healthy. So how does that play out in 73,000 American census tracts? I don't remember if this slide is based on those census tracts or simply the 100 largest metropolitan areas. I should look that up. But either way, what you observe here on the left is that uh, some proportion of white kids and Asian Pacific Islander kids are are growing up in neighborhoods of high stress according to the opportunity index. Maybe it's about 6% of white kids and 8% of Asian Pacific Islander kids. On the other hand, most of the kids, 40% or so, are growing up in very high and another 25% in high opportunity areas. On the right side of the slide is the distribution of opportunity indices for black kids and Latinx kids. And notice that, for example, African American kids, 40, 46%. Uh, are uh, are growing up in neighborhoods scored as uh, stressed, lower opportunity. A vivid way to look at that is this map, which comes from the work of the organization Diversity Data Kids that is doing this work. This is the our nation's uh, the Baltimore metropolitan area near near our nation's capital. And what's happened here is each of the census tract has been color coded by opportunity, very high to very low opportunity. Uh, lo uh, high opportunity are dark colored, low opportunity are light colored areas. <clears throat> uh, this is where kids live. No, this is where white kids live. Every dot here uh, represents 20 kids who are aged zero to 17 years. Notice the distribution. They're mostly in areas of reasonably high opportunity index. This is where black kids live. Uh, this is, uh, I guess we have to call it structural and it's racist uh, in the sense that your skin color is predicting the conditions of your, of your, uh, uh, of, of in which young children are finding themselves. Uh, by the way, I, I meant to insert this, but I didn't. If I were to show you a 1950 map of this area, or Seattle, or San Francisco, or Chicago, or New York, with respect to redlining for federal supports for mortgage, for example, it would be exactly the same distribution. The distributions of uh, chronic disease morbidity, of lack of opportunity for kids, and of racist-driven policy through redlining, going back all the way to the Jim Crow era and, and the pre-Civil War era, uh, it's the same distribution. So we're seeing here structural conditions, which according to Michael Marmot's research, would lead, according to the science, to lower, to lower um health levels for people under those stresses, and indeed they are. So you know the infant mortality data. This is uh, you know, more than a two to one mortality rate difference for infants, uh, black versus white in the US in 2015 for the double for, uh, for uh, American Indians. Uh, and it plays out in COVID and you know the data. You, you, you've seen this slide many times in many forms in many newspapers that uh, overall the, at raw rates, uh, black Americans are dying at four times the rate of whites from COVID, if you adjust for non-racial conditions like age and urbanicity and household composition and income, uh, you do it with some of that difference, but adjusted for all of those other conditions, still it's a two to one ratio of black to white uh, deaths in COVID. And 
The same kind of risk ratios apply depending on the database to many uh, people of color uh, in our country. So, um, so what? Uh, I, I want to show you one other thing, which is actually another way to look at this, the wages of these inequalities that Marmot talks about. Uh, this is a lens uh, through what is sometimes called a subway map or, or a bus map. It was developed, as I believe, by Sir Harry Burns in Glasgow, Scotland. That was the first one, I believe, around the year 2000. But this is the London tube. Uh, and what we've done here at every tube stop, uh, we've circled the tube stop and shown you the uh, life expectancy in that area. So here in in in, uh, in the West End of London and, and uh, Oxford Circus, Tottenham Court Road area, rich area of London, you're seeing numbers in 80, as high as 96 years of expectancy. It's, 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 90 is not uncommon. If you go to East London, about six or seven miles away, that's a area with lots of deprivation, uh, social deprivation. Here's Star Lane, 75-year uh, life expectancy. That is a 21-year life expectancy difference across the city, of, across London. Uh, 2.6 years lost for every mile on the London Tube, 8.4 months per minute on the London Tube. Here's the same thing in New York City. This is a midtown Manhattan, very wealthy. $180,000 a year median income. Most kids not born into Medicaid, uh, most people not people of color. Here's the South Bronx, uh, about three miles away or so. Uh, more than half the kids born into Medicaid, median income less than a third of Midtown Manhattan, uh, and almost and very largely people of color. And here you have a 10 year life expectancy difference. I just saw another set of data from New York City showing for approximately the same region, a 12 year life expectancy difference. That's two on the D train from Midtown Manhattan up to the South Bronx, that's uh, 2.3 years of life lost per mile. 2.3 year life, 2.3 years lost for every mile travel. That's six months of life lost for every minute on the subway. That's not quite right. It's not a ramp. It's not like you're losing life expectancy stop by stop. It's more like cliffs where there are areas of rather more severe uh, uh, stress and deprivation, uh, and that's where the life expectancy drops off. But I wanted to show you how big that is. Remember the triple aim, the difference between the repair shop and the population health work? Well, let's look at the repair shop first. Uh, one of the breakthroughs in medicine in my era has been statins, of course. Every, they're, they're mapped into quality metrics. Everyone's supposed to be on statins if your cholesterol is high, even if you want primary prevention. Very widely used drug. It's controversial, actually, more than you might think. Uh, this meta-analysis in the British Medical Journal in 2015 studied massive amounts of literature on statins, and um, they showed the controversy. In fact, some research trials suggested statins actually reduce life expectancy, but if you, if you, if you act if you take the most favorable view, uh, the most favorable studies say uh, 19 days of statin of life expectancy if you're on statins chronically for 20 years, primary prevention trials. Uh, so that's a gain, 20 days of lifespan for 20 years on statins, a day per year. And that's a medical breakthrough. That's the repair shop at its, at its uh, best in a way. Uh, 20 days of lifespan? That's what you lose on the D train in Manhattan in the first seven seconds as you leave 96th Street. That's what you lose in 43 feet riding the bus across Glasgow from the wealthy to the poor area. The, the, the discrepancies are this large all over the U.S. It's 16 years between the Chicago Loop and West Chicago. It's 15 years from the wealthy to the poor areas of Flint, Michigan. City by city, town by town, the social determinants are monsters compared to health care in determining who lives and who dies and how long they live. Um, now, nothing that I've shared with you is new. We've known it for a long time, but it's the effects have been around for chronically. This is uh, the effects of life expectancy, on life expectancy as, a re as related to income. Uh, Sir Michael Marmot gave me this slide, but uh, it's, it's American data. Uh, this is how the life expectancy for men who reach age 50 over a 30 year period, men who reached age 50 at 1920, 1930, 1940, 1950. Uh, and what you can see is gains uh, for the richest people in America, the, even the middle, substantial gains in life expectancy for people who were born in 1950 compared to 1920. But for the poorest 10% or 20%, almost no gains at all. And for women, loss. For the bottom, 
10, 20, even 30 percent of women in uh, income in life ex in income in this country over that period, 1920 to 1950, there has been a loss of life, life expectancy. The social determinants are monsters. They're enormous compared to what we do with the repair shop. Uh, if you take Michael Marmot's assertion that investment in social determinants, these gorillas, uh, are largely reflect a sense of fairness and distributions in society from people uh, who are who are fortunate to those less so, uh, the country has gone the wrong way. To the extent that government is the instrument of action on housing or food security or elder security or childhood edu early childhood education or workplace standards, this is what we've done. Between 1962 and 2018, uh, people at the bottom 50% or the middle 50% of the American uh, income um, levels uh, have paid more taxes over time. The top uh, 1% or 1% or 10% have seen very substantial decreases in their contributions. We have a highly regressive financing system with respect to the capability to invest in social determinants, which are the health determinants in our country. Now, as I said before, none of this is new, none of it at all. There's hardly a slide I've shown you that I couldn't have shown you five or 10 years ago or even longer. These social determinants, this, this talk about what makes us healthy and ill is based on sound science that is decades old. The first major reports here really stretch back to the mid 1950s and 1940s out of the UK originally, but in the US for surely since. In fact, you could even talk back to the Bull Moose uh, era of the turn of the last century uh, when we had um, uh, we began to reveal the effects between social determinants of wellness. But what has happened? What has happened is constant, continuing, increasing investment in the repair shop, now at 18% of our GDP, um, with uh, constant requests for more. I've never met, never been lobbied by a hospital for less money. Uh, constant increases in, in the costs and investments in intervention, all of which I celebrate. I, uh, nothing that I have ever seen about American healthcare makes me this, have the slightest taste for rationing of any type. Uh, everybody who needs an organ transplant should get it. Everybody who needs coronary surgery or chemotherapy should get it. Whatever works, people should have it. We can afford that, other countries do, at 12% of the GDP. But if you look at that regressive financing of this pursuit of health and well-being, we are way, way behind other countries. And the question is why? What is going on here? Uh, why would we not do the smart thing? Why would our country continue to tolerate the levels of underperformance in health and well-being that we do, knowing where the answers lie in early childhood and in our education system and our workplaces and our elder care, in our community infrastructures? Are we that benighted? Uh, it's hard to explain. And even if you were just interested in economic security, you'd have trouble explaining it because countries that are healthier are countries that are wealthier. Uh, I don't know the answer, and that's, I warned you that I would end up in a confused place. I do know racism is part of it. We, we, are, we are definitely still stuck with the, the, the consequences of, of uh, slavery and othering, especially for African Americans. And uh, we've been through cycle after cycle of, of, uh, of uh, ill treatment, unfairness uh, with respect to race. Uh, most Reason, recently, of course, emphasized in the in the in the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, the death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others. So racism is part of it. I know that. I don't think it's all of it, but it 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 it, it still beg, begs the question as to why we would not do the right stuff. And that has led me to the final slide and my final comment. And this is where I get really uncertain, but it's what I think. I think we've lost the moral vocabulary. I know how weak that sounds and arrogant, but I think maybe we've got to talk about what's right. Uh, we apparently talking about what's economically smart isn't enough. Getting the political leverage it doesn't seem to work. Uh, we better check our values. And so, if we did, like suppose we said we want to be healthy and we'll use a value structure to get us toward there. Uh, it leads me to this concept of a campaign for moral determinants of health. What I mean is, would our moral, what would our moral compass have us work on if we were committed to health? Will we use fairness to, to, to take
take Marmot's term as a lever to changing those social determinants, here's what we do. The first is we declare that. Uh, the, the, the symptom, the sign of that to me has to do with the embarrassing fact that the United States has failed to ratify a great many of the major human rights treaties of the UN, of the UN uh, regime. Uh, we have never ratified the Convention on Rights of Children. Our country has not ratified the Convention on Rights of Women. We've not ratified the Convention on Rights of, my, of, uh, of uh, Migrants and their families. We stood aside from the, the simple declaration that these are rights. And most egregiously, number two, we have not, other than in empty rhetoric, uh, made healthcare a human right in our nation. 30 million people left out, another 50 or 60 million uh, inadequately covered. You just heard that story about Medicare Advantage. It's a travesty. And it, it isolates us. There's no other Western nation that has not made healthcare a human right. So our moral compass would say, nope, it is here and let us just get there. It's doable. It's doable in short order. The third is that we would have to get reengaged with climate change. A funny, a funny thing to see on a list of healthcare determinants, but believe me, climate change is a healthcare determinant. That was declared, by the way, a couple of months ago by Dr. Victor Zhao, the president of the National Academy of Medicine, who's now has said that health and climate will become one of the top three challenges the National Academies will tackle. And believe me, he's right. If you look at the effects of climate change on, uh, on climate refugees, climate wars, uh, water insecurity, food insecurity, and weather events, of course, that we've seen in this country, it will, uh, it's hard to say that anything could dwarf the COVID pandemic, but it would. The numbers are staggering. Uh, and we have, unfortunately, in the Trump era, stood aside. Uh, it's time to get reengaged. I'm happy to see uh, John Kerry and Gina McCarthy and the president himself uh, declaring that it, it's serious business. The fourth would be that we would fix criminal justice. Again, odd to see on this list, but it's actually the one that's most most on my mind, because I am most of all of this, I think I'm most offended by what I've learned about our criminal justice system. 2.3 million people in our jails and prisons, seven to one ratio black to white, five to one ratio Latinx to white. 70% of them have either substance misuse or mental health issues. And we do not have a criminal justice system. We certainly don't have a restorative justice system, except in some pockets. It is an embarrassment. We're, we are incarcerating people in our nation at a rate much higher than any other, certainly than any other democracy, I, I, probably than almost any other nation so far as the data I see. And we are not using it for anything like restoration. We don't have alternatives to prisons. We don't have compassionate care in prisons. And we don't have reentry that really works. And it's time to fix that in our nation. 10 million people cycle through our jails every year. Most of them not convicted, but they're still incarcerated. They do not have access to health care that's, that's accredited. Do you, you know there's a law in this country that, that makes it illegal for Medicaid to cover incarcerated people? Uh, it's a travesty. Uh, the fifth has to do with immigration. We are in a mess. It's very, very difficult, but I'm just sick and tired of seeing uh, the induction of harm at our southern border. And we need to figure that out, and Congress has not engaged, not at the level we need to. I mentioned hunger and homelessness. Uh, why would a nation at our level of wealth have 17 million hungry children today, or even 700,000 chronically homeless. There is no reason on earth why our nation could not end hunger and end homelessness, period. End of story. I don't see any barrier except will. And then, of course, politics. The seventh has to do with a governmental framework for working on that. We need to restore dignity, order, justice, equity to the democratic institutions that we use in our government and the rule of science so that we work with facts. And the facts say, Health can be found in the social determinants. That's where we need to invest in an all of government effort. I do trace this back to the deficiency in our, in our voting systems, which you've actually seen <laughs> terrible uh, new examples of in Georgia and other states right now. But even beyond that, I think you probably know that in the presidential election, a resident of a rural state in this country uh, has an electoral has a vote that counts in the electoral college 70 times seven zero times the weight of someone in an urban state that's not the democracy i thought we had um medicare and medicaid and by the way i know i'm speaking to the center for medicare advocacy please embrace medicaid they are absolutely equally important in fact i might even offend you by suggesting medicaid may be certainly more vulnerable now than medicare but the two of them can play a role here. When I ran Medicare and Medicaid, every day I went to work thinking about how to redress these disparities and make that our mission. 
uh, I think it should be our mission. And I think we need policies and advocates that believe that as well. I thank you very much for the chance to share these thoughts. Again, Senator Rockefeller, thank you so much for what you've done for this nation. And it's an honor to have been able to speak uh, in, an, in a lecture with your name on it. All right, thank you, Dr. Berwick. Bear with us. We're gonna switch our presenter back. We're gonna pull Judy and Judy back up as well. Well, thank right. you. I'm so stirred by your, um, troubled by your remarks and and uh, positively stirred by your um, last few remarks and conclusion. Judy Fader is the president of our board. Go ahead, Judy. You're on mute, Judy. You're on mute. Not anymore. <laughs> That fixed it. Don, you are uh, preaching to a motivated group and uh, speaking for myself, and it sounds like Judy as well, you've only given us further motivation. It's a, um, an honor to be thanking you, to have listened to you, and I believe I can say on Senator Rockefeller's behalf uh, to be thanking you for the lecture in his name. I have a question for you, and I have my fingers crossed as to your a positive uh, answer, which is, do you see anything in the current environment, perhaps additional motivation by the experience of COVID or recent politics or anything you see, that, our, that we are likely to begin to address the um, horrific record that you've described? I see two things, Judy. One is the knowledge base. The science is strong here. This is not just rhetoric or, or politics. It is politics. But what, what Marmot and people like that have given us through decades of research are a scientific foundation, an evidence foundation that can make us very confident about, about how to begin to tackle these gar barriers. The second is community. Uh, I, I have this feeling, I'm not enough of a sociologist to be sure, that the, the will and the values and the, the love and affection and fairness that Marmon talks about is accessible at low at at locality level. And I, I, I have this dream, this hope that there will emerge communities in this country that say, we're gonna get this under control. And I'm talking to some of them. I can feel the energy, not in Washington, no. Uh, although I, I must say what uh, Joe Biden did with the rescue package is, uh, it took my breath away because he actually began to address it. And if he can stick with it and we can get a couple of Republicans to start to get with this, I think I think it's fixable. But I, I, I'll put my faith right now in localities and communities. One thing that I must say, and I, prom I promise not to talk about 30 seconds more, is this is a health care list for me also. That is, I think at 18 percent of the gross domestic product with the prestige and gravitas health care has, with a good intention that the professions profess, we ought to take this on. Health care should fix the criminal justice system or do whatever it can. I, I, I have a proposal for the American Hospital Association, American Medical Association, for the American Whatever Association. Stop lobbying for more income for three years. Put your lobbyists on another job. Let's fix hunger, homelessness, criminal justice, uh, get reengaged in climate change. Lobby for that and then go for more money. Uh, if we actually shifted our, our attention to getting the job done that way, uh, things would be things would start to move. So I, I put this on our backs. We we we, we as healers should pursue this agenda, even though it looks right now not quite in our swim lane. At, well, you're talking to. If anybody can take it on, I'm I'm going to turn it over to Judy to lead the charge. Thank you <laughs> so much. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> Keep it up. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Berwick. And uh, let me assure you that we are um, we are very aware uh, that Medicare is our wheelhouse, but it is intricately intertwined with Medicaid, the Affordable Care Act, and indeed, we shouldn't have this many-headed monster that we call a healthcare system. Uh, we'd be better off with without uh, them in silos. So we work yeah. together with many on the, who've listened to you today, who, who specialize in Medicaid 
and uh, we intertwine our advocacy to make sure we're aware of and adding our expertise as best and advocacy as best we can. But we do think that Medicare has gone unattended uh, to of late in a certain way, except for in the private domain of Medicare Advantage, oh. which is not serving us well. I um, um, absolutely the 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 momentum toward privatization of Medicare is the biggest threat to social insurance I've seen, and it's a, it's a gold rush, and we, it needs to stop. So I'm with yep. you on that completely. And it needs to be shouted because it's under the radar. So it is. With that, I, I do want to um, ask Matt, uh, Scott to change the slide and, and thank you so very much. Uh, today happens to also be Senator Rockefeller's anniversary. Uh, oh. So I'm, um, I'm standing in more than I might otherwise for him. Um, I hope you've received or will soon a token of the, the, the presentation today and um, our gratitude for your work, for your lifelong work as a healer, and for uh, blessing us with your time and attention today. So uh, this is for the audience, a remote version of the uh, J. Uh, Rockefeller Lecture Award that we present to Dr. Donald Erwick in recognition of his commitment to healthcare as a human right, which you spoke to today and which we are committed as an organization taking on for all. Uh, Dr. Berwick, the award said, serves individuals, families, and the world as a healer who recognizes the humanity in all. And that word healer I've seen in your own references to your work and to you so often. It's a beautiful, beautiful endeavor that you've undertaken and continue to undertake. And in addition, Dr. Berwick, um, in lieu of the honor an honorarium, asked that we make a donation to a charity or local soup kitchen. Unfortunately, here in Eastern Connecticut, I am happy to have found your home. <laughs> um, we have the need for a soup kitchen. We have quite an underrepresented um, group who are uh, hungry. So, uh, Significant donation has been made in your name to the Covenant Soup Kitchen in Willimantic, Connecticut. And um, it will make a difference there. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an honor, privilege, and I hope we will find ways to work together in the days ahead. I do too. Thanks for your leadership, Judy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Berwick.